Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Good morning. Here's the NBC News from around the world. This is James Stevenson reporting from the NBC Newsroom in New York. In a few moments, we'll call in NBC observers from overseas. But first, here are the late developments. Reports seeping through the news blackout on the Western Front indicate that furious fighting is in progress on the northern sector where the German counterattack has driven approximately 18 miles into Belgium. Allied planes are smashing at German armored columns. In the Balkans, the Red Army is only three miles from Kassa in eastern Slovakia, threatening the German defense from Poland down to Hungary. General MacArthur's troops are continuing their push up Mindoro Island and meeting with little ground resistance. At the same time, United States headquarters in the Pacific reveal that 742 Jap planes have been put out of action in the past week. B-29s based in China today smashed at airplane factories in Omura, key town in western Kyushu Island at the southern end of the Japanese homeland, while the Imperial headquarters claimed that two Allied warships and two transports were sunk off Mindoro. The Japanese claims were not confirmed by Allied headquarters. And now, a few words from your announcer. Every report that has come back from the battlefront stresses this fact. Soldiers want letters from home more than anything else. Are you writing regularly to your soldier... And are you making sure that your letters reach him surely and quickly? You can make sure you know by using V-Mail, the fast, sure, safe way of getting your letter in the hands of your soldier just as quickly as possible. V-Mail flies. It saves precious cargo space. It's the ideal way to keep in touch with your fighting man. V-Mail blanks can be obtained at drug stores, department stores, stationers, and at post offices. So don't take chances on delays. Use the fast, safe, and sure way every time you write. Write often and use V-mail. Now here's James Stevenson and your World News Roundup. The German counterattack against the American First Army is not being taken lightly by Allied leaders. Neither is there any doubt in their minds that the drive will be stopped, although it will cost the Allies in great losses of men and material. Allied headquarters are maintaining a strict secrecy on the situation for security reasons because any factual information of losses or the steps being taken to stop the German drive would be helpful to the enemy. However, there can be no doubt that we have lost considerable men and equipment. The Germans have advanced at least as far as the small Belgian town of Stavlo, about 18 miles from the German border. The attack was a complete surprise, which means that Allied units in its path were overrun. And as artillery is usually employed, depending on caliber, from between two to five miles behind the infantry combat lines, it is quite obvious that we must have lost considerable guns of various sizes. In addition, the average infantry division will fight on a front of approximately six to seven miles, requiring a depth of about the same distance for deploying of troops and bringing up supplies and replacements, which means that the German drive on a front of around 70 miles must have involved at least eight Allied divisions at a minimum and pushed them completely out of their positions. Such an action, depending on the speed with which it was accomplished, would naturally result in heavy losses to the defenders. The greater the speed, the greater the losses, particularly in prisoners taken. Of course, as I said before, there is an almost complete blackout of news of the fighting by Allied Supreme Headquarters. But military principles such as tactics are commonly known, and from the meager facts we have, it appears that we must be prepared for bad news when full reports are finally made. The Germans are suffering huge losses, too, Field Marshal von Rundstedt is throwing great masses of tanks and men into his drive with almost reckless abandon. It is questionable as to just how long he can keep up the pace. He has committed great numbers of his reserves, both men and equipment. The odds are completely against him in the long run. And the natural query, so far as military science is concerned, 
is where does he go from here and what can he accomplish in a final showdown. We have more reserves and much more material. We can take more losses than he can and still come up strong. In other words, it probably would have been wiser from the military viewpoint for the Germans to continue a holding defense such as they had organized along the Western Front, hoping to tire us out and thus win a negotiated peace. But having committed themselves to this counterattack, it will be much more difficult for them to play a holding game in the future, for they won't have the men and equipment with which to do it. Their losses now will make it impossible. But it may be that the Nazi game is to make us one last supreme effort and then we'll go down fighting, giving future generations of Germans an ideal upon which to build a new super race. In the meantime, the port of Antwerp may be endangered, and through, Ant- uh, through Antwerp, much Allied supplies flow to the front. That would be a serious thing for us if we lost Antwerp. And now for our first report from overseas, we go to NBC in the Pacific. This is Pat Flaherty speaking from the Philippines. Eyewitness accounts coming back from our beachhead and perimeter on Mindoro tell of our forces moving into a veritable paradise. Apparently, the little island did not suffer much from the Jap military rule. Conversation with two United States Army Signal Corps men, Lieutenant Jeff Lutis of New York City, photo unit officer, and PFC Bill Woodruff of Newton, Massachusetts, combat photographer, described the operation as being a perfect landing on a perfect beach. These two men went ashore in the first assault wave, but they said there wasn't even token resistance by the Japs. The Filipinos said the Japs had warned them that the Americans would strike Mindoro between December 12th and 20th. We hit it on the 15th. The area is ideal for air ships, and our aviation engineers are ahead of schedule on their strip project. The two small strips formerly used by the Sugar Plantation Company were relics of the past and have been left as such. It won't be long before the Japs northward will be feeling the sting of these new air bases. When they fled to the mountains, the small Jap garrison force made little effort to destroy valuable equipment and machinery on the island. However, they smashed most of their weather and observation installations. Twenty American pre-war form tractors painted of very bright yellow were found intact and ready for use. San Jose itself, said DFC Woodward, is very neat and attractive, just like a little New England farm village, although the new military traffic is kicking up a lot of dust. Talking with some of the Filipinos, Lieutenant Ludic learned of a very dramatic highlight. The Jap garrison commander told the Navy that he had a son now serving in the United States. We take you now to the NBC newsroom in New York. The rosy picture in the Pacific is offset somewhat by developments in Europe. For a first-hand report, we take you now to NBC in London. This is Ed Hawker in London. Here is at home this morning the one big subject of discussion has to do with the first U.S. Army front. Everywhere, people ask the same question. How are the Americans doing today? The answer, as we know, is that neither side is saying. There's still a security ban on dispatches from General Hodges' area of operations. And the Germans today are speaking in vague terms about the next few weeks, saying the next few weeks will require the last ounce of strength from the Reich, saying that grim battles await the German soldiers, that all the steadfastness Germans have learnt during the past tough months will be needed now. The one thing we do know, and this from General Eisenhower's morning communique, is that von Rundstedt continues to exert formidable pressure against the U.S. First Army, that the Germans are pouring transport and armor as well as paratroops into the thrust to an extent unknown since their initial onslaughts against the Normandy beachhead, that the greatest battle of the West is raging both in the air and on the ground, and that early indications point to heavy losses in men and materiel for both sides. The British generally take the attitude that von Rundstedt's drive is a terrific gamble for time. Realistically, they point to the apparent fact that the thrust was a surprise to the obvious fact that the Nazis have reorganized after the German army's greatest defeat of all time, and their conclusion that such an achievement is clearly a military success. 
As for any comparison with Ludendorff's offensive in 1918, that's fantastic in the words of one commentator. Based on false analogies, says another, if only because Ludendorff in 1918 opened up with final victory for the Germans in mind. Today, when Rundstedt can hope for no more than a postponement of the final Allied victory. In his late report, pointing up the situation on the Western Front today, the Prime Minister himself, here in Commons, here in Commons in London, said a great battle is proceeding now. He then went on to say, in answer to questions, that he did not expect to make any summing up of the situation before the new year, certainly not before Christmas. Elsewhere on the front, in General Patton's zone, mostly mopping up activity, progress slow. On the 9th U.S. Army front, the slightly rejuvenated Luftwaffe during the night raided both forward and rear areas. And General Simpson's army is being subjected to an almost continuous shelling by German artillery and mortars. And at the southern tip of the front, there's stiff fighting northwest of Calmer. This is Ed Hawker in London, now switching you to NBC in Washington. This is Leif Eid in Washington. And this morning, just about everything in Washington is foreign affairs. Ed Stettinius' statement on the Polish boundary question is seen here as holding the door open a little while longer for London's Polish government in exile to make a deal. If they don't hurry, then Stalin's likely to slam the door shut and sit down and talk business with the Soviet-sponsored Lublin Committee. But Washington's pretty much of a mind in thinking that the Polish boundary question will be settled soon on Moscow's terms. Our foreign policy is getting a thorough going over in the Senate. That coalition of three new dealers and progressive Phil La Follett is holding up the vote on Joe Grew, Nelson Rockefeller, Will Clayton, Jimmy Dunn, Archie McLeish, and General Holmes. Claude Pepper let go for almost five hours on the floor yesterday in what he calls a preamble. He wants to hold the nominations over till the next Congress. But Tom Connolly, who's trying to push these names through, says the whole thing's obviously a filibuster. And he talks about possible night sessions. Senators Vandenberg and Brooks want the president to outline our whole foreign policy. Even old High Johnson, one of the spearheads that killed the League of Nations over 20 years ago, spoke up in sympathy for Greece. And it begins to look as though Connolly's going to have to pull a letter from the White House to get his men voted on. Otherwise, in Washington... It begins to look as though Sewell Avery may get another free ride out of his offices. Montgomery Ward let the deadline pass last night for telling the War Labor Board it'll obey its wage orders. So now the case goes to the White House. Those new draft orders say that every man under 30 who has been rejected for service since last February, except those with obvious physical defects, must be re-examined in 1945. And maternity ward statisticians at the War Production Board say that the 1944 production of diaper cloth figures 34 yards for every one of our young citizens. This is Ede in Washington, returning you now to New York. So far this morning, we've heard from NBC observers Pat Flaherty in the Philippines, Ed Hocker in London, and Leif Ede in Washington. Now here's your announcer, and then I'll be back with more news. The most critical manpower problem facing our country today is not in the Army or the Navy or the war plants, serious as is the need for men in those classifications. America needs men most in the merchant marine, men to man the supply ships that carry the guns and shells and gas and trucks to the scene of action. A lot of men have left the merchant marine. America wants them to come back, along with thousands of other men with or without sea experience. As a matter of fact, America needs 43,000 new merchant seamen within the next 12 months. Mates, engineers of all classes, able-bodied seamen, firemen, oilers, water tenders, radio telegraphers, cooks, and telegraphers. If you qualify for any of these jobs, wire right now, collect, to Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C., or apply at War Shipping Administration offices in major ports, maritime union halls, or U.S. employment offices in principal cities. And again, here's James Stevenson in the NBC Newsroom. The United States Office of War Information announced today that America, a monthly magazine designed to acquaint the Soviet people with the United States, has been placed on sale in Russia. The new publication is the first effort by the United States to circulate propaganda in the Soviet Union. It's printed in the Russian language, of course. 
Well, the Japanese are now being hit with made-in-Japan bombs. Of course, it's all for effect on Japanese morale. Japanese bombs captured at Tarawa have been used by the Army Air Forces, according to Colonel William S. McCullough, Ordnance Officer, from Lieutenant General Millard Harmon's command. He said planes of the 7th Air Force dropped a few duds so the Japs could see that they were getting their own bombs right back. And another Japanese leader has left the war scene, according to a Tokyo broadcast which said Jinjiro Fujiwara, munitions minister, had resigned for health reasons and had been succeeded by Shigeru Yoshida, former welfare minister. And that's the morning's news from around the world. This is James Stevenson saying goodbye from the NBC newsroom in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Let's stay home this Christmas and let furloughs come first. Don't travel unless it's absolutely necessary. Don't rob a serviceman of the chance to see his family at Christmas time. WEAF, New York. This is Don Goddard with your news at noon, a program brought to you by Grove Laboratories, serving the health of the nation for over 50 years. When you've got a real old-fashioned cold, you know you're in for a miserable time. But there's no need to just suffer along and endure all this. Get Grove's cold tablets for quick relief. Grove's cold tablets are a multiple medicine compounded like a doctor's prescription. Eight active medicinal ingredients get right down inside and go to work internally. Get Grove's cold tablets. Take exactly as directed. That's G-R-O-V-E-S, Grove's cold tablets. German tanks, some of them backed up by infantry, are striking deeper into Belgium today. But in some sectors, American tanks and infantry are holding firm. The latest dispatches from Supreme Headquarters in Paris say that Nazi armor has advanced more than 20 miles into Belgium and Luxembourg on this, the fourth day of the greatest German counteroffensive of this war. Front dispatches quote a senior staff officer with the First Army as saying that the German offensive still is mounting and has not yet reached its climax. Other dispatches tell of German paratroopers entering Belgian villages dressed as the United States Army uniforms, in, as United States Army soldiers, and driving captured American jeeps. And there are reports that the Nazis are using captured Sherman tanks and are murdering Belgian civilians who show their pro-Allied sympathies. And there's one tragic story of a group of Germans riding in a captured American tank. One of the Germans leaned out and yelled to a passing group of Yanks to come on over in good English. The G.I.s started over toward the tank, and they were mowed down by machine guns. Today's German high command communique says that more than 10,000 American prisoners have been taken so far in this drive. 200 American tanks destroyed or captured, and 124 Allied planes shot down. And the Nazis say their spearheads are still advancing. No more details. The Germans also have a news blackout. Allied headquarters lifted one corner of our blackout this morning, just long enough to let us know that up to Monday noon, that's 48 hours ago, the Germans had punched out gains of 18 to 20 miles, had cut off several large American units, and had knifed into within 22 miles of the great Allied supply base of Liège. But that was 48 hours ago, and that's history now. For news of what's happening today on the Western Front, we have the first direct radio report on the German offensive from NBC's reporter with the First Army, from Jim Cassidy, who's covered the Nazi drive from the beginning. And I'd like to point out a few things to listen for in James Cassidy's broadcast. He says the German attack is continuing in undiminished strength. The situation is still grave. Listen for that. His words give the lie to all the glamorized and over-optimistic reports We've been getting that the Nazi offensive is dying down of its own weight and that it was nothing to worry about after all. And so for a first-hand report of the truth from the First Army Front, the truth so far as we're able to give it to you, here's NBC's James Cassidy, recorded from a broadcast made earlier this morning. This is James Cassidy with the American First Army speaking from Belgium. This morning, official Army sources reveal that the powerful German attack launched this week has resulted in the cutting off of numbers of American troops near Sandvit, a Belgian town about 25 miles south of Eupen. Our troops were caught in the German armored pincers, which has now carried the enemy to a point within three miles of Sandvit. Three miles further south, the Germans have broken through to the village of Mosfeld. There were several German trucks against the Belgian and Luxembourg frontier, but the chief one came from the Schnee Eiffel Forest. It is disclosed today that in the course of that attack, some other American troops were surrounded. This morning, the German attack continues in undiminished strength. The situation is still grave. 
news of the first big setback of the first American army has echoed in terms of wild rumors all over Belgium and Luxembourg. On Sunday night, when I was in Luxembourg City, rumor had it that the Germans were only a couple of miles outside the town. That was an exaggerated story. Next night, in Brussels, worried people asked me if the Germans had broken through our lines and were marching on the capital of Belgium itself. In the past two days, I have ranged hundreds of miles in my jeep from the front lines to the rear areas and back again. Although some people in areas not affected by the attack do display nervousness, the majority are calm. Military opinion had warned of a counterattack as being in the cards, a virtual necessity. Uh, the better formed in persons uh, with whom I've spoken seem to believe that if they succeed in breaking up this powerful German attack, it may be an early end of the enemy's attacking potentiality. It is chiefly among those less well-informed that any panic has been shown. Numerous frontline areas in eastern Belgium have now been evacuated. I was in one village, and it was an experience I shall never forget. The experience of conquest in reverse. The wild cheers and welcome accorded the American liberators three months ago have now turned to ashes. Most civilians stood in silent groups around the streets watching the mud-spattered army trucks moving. Some of the more nervous individuals began themselves to pack a few household goods. And in their space with military traffic could be seen an occasional civilian automobile containing perhaps the husband and wife in the front seat and one or more children crouching above the heaps of bed clothing in the rear of the car. American flags were removed from some of the shop windows and so were the forbidden Belgian banners. As I left, I wondered how long it would be until Nazi banners would once again adorn those windows which for three months have displayed the stars and stripes. There was near panic in this town when the sound of the moving traffic and shouts of the soldiers was interrupted with a terrific crash as a bomb fell next to the main highway. Excited bystanders disagreed as to whether it had come from a Nazi plane or a bomb escaped from one of the American fighters circling overhead to protect the American convoys. That was James Cassidy, NBC's correspondent of the American First Army Front. I hope you noticed that he said military opinion warned that such a German counterattack was in the cards. We can only hope that the same military opinion, the commanders of the American armies, were prepared for this Nazi thrust. One dispatch from First Army Headquarters sees a ray of sunshine in all this dark news. It says that if handled properly, the war can be won right now. And observers are agreed that this is Germany's major bid to halt the Allies west of the Rhine and so to win a compromise peace, if possible. More news in just a moment. They say misery loves company, but wouldn't misery prefer relief? Now, the usual miseries of a common cold can be relieved fast with Grove's Cold Tablets. It's a multiple medicine compounded like a doctor's prescription. Here's no more one-purpose tablet, but a combination of eight active medicinal ingredients that'll take right hold and work internally to help all these usual cold miseries at once. Reduce fever, relieve headache, alleviate body aches and pains, reduce nasal stuffiness. No wonder millions of cold sufferers have turned to Groves for cold misery relief for 51 years. Of course, rest and avoid exposure. Insist on the genuine Groves cold tablets. Take exactly as directed. Look for the Groves signature on the box, G-R-O-V-E-S, known to millions for over half a century as famous bromoquinine cold tablets. Prime Minister Churchill has battled a new flood of criticism in the House of Commons over British intervention in Greece. He said that Britain, the United States, and Russia are cooperating fully on the prosecution of the war, but the Prime Minister added, whether there is complete agreement on every aspect of these matters is another question altogether. Churchill declared the burden of settling the civil war in Greece has fallen upon Britain. He said, and I quote, we had a certain task thrown upon us, and we are discharging it to the best of our ability. Foreign Secretary Eden told Commons that Britain has no selfish aims in Greece, and would be glad to turn over its responsibilities as soon as it can do so, consistent with its obligation. Eden said no agreement yet had been reached in the civil war. He admitted under pressure that the right-wing Edes forces in Athens have been allowed to keep their arms, although British officers have demanded that the left-wing Alos forces disarm as a prelude to any armistice. Alos leaders have said repeatedly that they will not surrender their weapons so long as Edes troops remained armed. Meanwhile, Athens is considerably calmer today, the shooting has died down, but the civil strife is not over by any means. General Scobie, the British commander there, has just announced his determination to carry the fight to the ALOS forces. Scobie has warned civilians in Athens that ALOS guns, firing upon the city after 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, 
will be attacked with all arms at his disposal. And over in Italy, British 8th Army troops have regained the initiative again after falling back under sharp German counterattack. The British have taken a small village north of Faenza, while Indian and Polish units have cleaned up Nazi resistance along the south bank of the Senio River. In Rome, the new Italian cabinet announces it will hold democratic elections throughout liberated Italy next spring, the first free elections held in Italy in 24 years. Today, the Russians are driving on the Slovakian stronghold of Kassa from two directions. Soviet forces are from 9 to 14 miles from the big German-held railroad and highway center, and the German and Hungarian defenders are falling back. Many of the Hungarian troops are deserting their Nazi allies. Axis reports of another B-29 raid on Tokyo last night have been confirmed now, but it's nothing to cheer about, really. It was just another harassing attack, and we can guess that the main purpose was to take photographs and get weather information. Three B-29s from Saipan dropped bombs on the capital, which they found blacked out in anticipation of their coming. The superfortress crews say their bombs set fire over a large area, and Tokyo says the damage was slight. Tokyo Radio also says today the Battle of the Philippines has the same vital importance to Japan as the Western Front counteroffensive has to Germany, and if that's true, Japan is just about through. For American troops on Leyte have begun the final cleanup against a few thousand trapped Japs on the island, and the American invaders of Mindoro have yet to meet any enemy resistance. Back home, Uncle Sam's G-men have opened another chapter of the case of the U-boat saboteurs. This morning, they arrested in Newark, New Jersey, one Carl Emil Ludwig Krepper, 60-year-old naturalized German, one-time Lutheran minister who had held pastorates in Philadelphia, in Newark, in Rawway, and Carteret, New Jersey. And lately, he had worked in the Newark Club as a steward. They took Krepper in tow after a federal grand jury had handed up an indictment which accused the former preacher as the contact man for the eight Nazi saboteurs who landed on the Atlantic coast from a submarine back in 1942. According to the tale, as recounted by Chief G-Man uh, J. Edgar Hoover, it was an ordinary white handkerchief found in the pocket of one of those saboteurs that set the federal agents on Krepper's trail. Government laboratory sleuth found written thereon in invisible ink the pastor's name and an address in Rawway, New Jersey, where he could be found. The plot, as the G-Men tell it, was hatched in the Nazi spike school over in Germany. Krepper already was an American citizen, having taken out his papers in 1922 in Philadelphia. But, charges the government, he conspired with the head of the spy school in Germany and with his wife, Bertha, on a visit to Germany to set up a haven in this country for the poor persecuted Germans who might arrive in this country by submarine, for example. His wife stayed on in Germany and collected the pay that the Nazis agreed to give Krepper, says the, say the G-men today, and she may still be doing it for all we know. After he returned to this country with his instructions in 1941, Krepper gave up his connections with the church. For two years, the Federals have been on his trail, and one wonders, hearing this story, how many more like that are abroad in the land. All but one of those six men just appointed to the State Department have been sworn in this morning, and the Department has begun to move to restore its operations to full staffed running order. All took the oath of office except Brigadier General Julius C. Holmes, named as an Assistant Secretary, but who is still in Europe with General Eisenhower's very busy staff. Justice Stanley Reed administered the oath to Joseph C. Grew, Undersecretary, William L. Clayton, Nelson Rockefeller, Archibald McLeish, James C. Dunn, all Assistant Secretaries. The city of Trenton, New Jersey, has been tied up this morning with that bus strike, and travel is practically paralyzed. Thousands of war workers kept from their jobs. Fifty drivers and garage attendants of the Trenton Transit Company, major carrier in that area, which has no streetcars, began their walkout yesterday morning. The strikers... Members of the Amalgamated Association of Street, Electric, Railway, and Motor Coach Workers of America, AFL, left their buses and garages in protest over the appeal of the company from a decision of the Regional War Labor Board. The decision approved a 40-hour week for garage men and 44 for drivers with time and a half for overtime. The company has asked the national WLB to review the case, and the decision is pending. Big war plants are affected. A few short items. The Montgomery Ward case is on the president's desk for action. New York City is getting set for a record crowd over the weekend, but the hotels say... They have a few rooms for Christmas vacationers. And it was mighty cold this morning in New York, officially. In fact, the subway trains were delayed during the rush hour, and so were the Long Island and New Haven, New York, New Haven, and Hartford railroads. Albany is without water today, a result of a break in a 30-inch main up there. Will you invite the Grove Laboratories to dinner? Will you let our research staff examine your meals for a week? What if you're not getting enough B-complex vitamins in your food? As many as 70% of American families in some regions don't get enough B-complex vitamins to meet highest health standards. That's from two of the best authorities in this country. Well, check it for yourself. 
Did you eat several servings of chickpeas this week? Did you have lots of fresh broccoli? Several helpings of lean pork? Plenty of peanuts? Wheat germ? Kidneys? Soybeans? Unless you ate these or other rich, B-complex foods each day, fresh and properly cooked, you yourself and all your family may have failed to get enough B-complex vitamins this week. If so, we suggest you add B. Groves B-complex vitamins to your diet. We suggest that you take Groves B-complex vitamins regularly, faithfully, daily. Large size, only $1. Big family size, only $3. That's G-R-O-V-E-S, Groves B-complex vitamins. Sunny this afternoon. That's your news at noon. This is Don Goddard speaking for Grove Laboratories and saying see you tomorrow. Don Goddard reports the news at noon from the NBC Newsroom in New York. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. David's Bridal, where brides and bridesmaids get fabulously dressed. We let our friends pick out what we wear. Show off our dance moves. Obsess over every little detail. Hold your hand through it all. Smile bravely when it's time to let go. Make your dreams come true. The things we do for love. Only at David's Bridal. 